Welcome again to those of you joining us online. We're glad that you're with us. Open your Bibles this morning, please, to Luke chapter 6. We're not quite going to finish the chapter this morning. Uh, Next week, we'll pick up the last little section and move into chapter 7. But today, we are looking at verses 20 through 42. And we are in what is Luke's accounting of the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll talk about that. And so we are going to begin by reading verses uh, 20 through 42 of Luke chapter 6. If you'd like to turn there with us and read along in your Bible. um, Or, of course, you can use the screen up here. We have the same text up on the screen. So Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also should do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the highest. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be measured to you. Excuse me, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. As always, we are grateful that we get to read it together and hear it. And Lord, respond to it. And we pray that as your word has already been speaking to us and already been working in our lives, that right now you would, by the strength of your word, by the power of your spirit, begin to till the fallow ground in our hearts, that we might be responsive and attentive to all that you have for us. And as always, Lord, we say to you, speak for your servants who are listening, for this is the word of the Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When you read in Matthew's gospel, Matthew's accounting of the Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5, 6, and 7, and it's a quite long account. And there are some who would say here of Luke's accounting that it's just Luke's sort of version of that same event, and then there are others who would say that this is a different occasion and that they would explain it like this, that Jesus as sort of an itinerant teacher as he would travel around, would often speak on the same things uh, so that people in different locations would hear what he had to say. You may remember from our previous week's study that Jesus was making sort of a circuit through the region of Galilee, and we talked about there being 200 towns or cities there. And so it would be common to expect that he might say the same things in other locations. Uh, so it's interesting, half the... Uh, Commentators and scholars say that this is an accounting of a different occasion where Jesus is presenting a sort of a scaled-down version of the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll leave it to those people to sort that out. However, as we go through it here today, certainly many of the exact same topics are covered as are covered in the Sermon on the Mount, but not in their entirety as we know it from Matthew chapter 5 through 7. But one of the beauty... Uh, beautiful pieces of the Gospels as they give their different accounts is that even though we may have heard it over there in one of the other Gospel accounts, we need to hear it again here, and we need to hear it with that slightly different emphasis. Uh, sometimes it can just open the door to us hearing another Gospel writer's perspective on a similar situation. It's sort of like when we talk to our friends, right, and we're trying to find out what happened, you know, in an accident or, you know, in a situation. And we, we talk to, you know, one spouse and we get a certain version and a point of view and we're like, oh, that's interesting. And you kind of walk away going, but I have questions. And then you talk to the other one and they kind of fill in the blanks for you. And so I believe that's what these accounts can do for us. And so as we look at this account today... It's, again, a condensed version, but it really gets to the heart of some very key issues that we face in our lives. Now, as Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, both uh, the Matthew version as well as this version here, there is something that the rabbis had as sort of a teaching method, and they would call it stringing pearls together. The idea is simply this, sort of like a, uh, an approach to the Proverbs. You know, as you read the book of Proverbs, you kind of go from verse to verse, and you get all of these nuggets and these pearls of wisdom on different topics. And so it is true, both with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's account, as well as here in Luke's account. We are getting a string of pearls, a string of of, of drops of wisdom from the mouth and the mind of Jesus, from the heart of God. And a lot of this is around how to have a life of blessing. But what's behind having a life of blessing, and if I were to ask that question, I'm sure I'd get a 100% show of hands, you know, do you want to be blessed in your life? And I'd think we'd all go, yeah, I do, I certainly do. What Jesus focuses on as he goes through these different scenarios, these different pearls, if you will, is he's getting to our attitudes. Everybody like to have your attitude addressed from time to time? A little attitude adjustment, we call it. Well, we could have called today's message an attitude adjustment. I uh, call it attitude is spiritual. Because what Jesus deals with is our attitude toward different circumstances that we encounter in life. So circumstances, people, and ourselves are the three main topics he addresses in our passage today. What should our attitude be toward our circumstances in life? And he gives some particular circumstances. What should our attitude be toward people when people don't treat us the way we hope or would like to be treated? And what about ourselves? How do we view ourselves in all of this? You know, the truth is, too often we have too much of a high view of ourselves. 
And so Jesus addresses these things uh, as we go through them today. Now, if you've ever read through the Beatitudes in Matthew's account, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and I certainly would commend that to you this week, or in Luke's account here, when we read these things, we, we go, man, th this is amazing. Th this is amazing, the things that Jesus had to say. Uh, one commentator said this, it's been said, if you took all of the good advice for how to live ever uttered by any philosopher or psychiatrist or counselor or person of wisdom, and you took out all of their foolishness and you boiled it down to the real essentials, you would be left with a poor imitation of the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. Because certainly the wisdom of the world, as Paul says, is foolishness to God. And so we'll talk about this more as we get into it, but let us get our wisdom from God himself. Beginning in verse 20, as Jesus is teaching his disciples, he says, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Let's be reminded. The word blessed means, oh, how happy. And the idea is not happiness like we think of it, uh, but in the truest, most godly sense of the word. It's not about our being entertained and just being happy in the moment, you know, being happy with our life. Okay, my bank account's full, my belly's full, my gas tank is full, I'm happy. That's not what it's about. Happy is about being satisfied with God, being satisfied in his provision for our lives. And he says here, blessed are you poor for yours in the kingdom is the kingdom of God. In Matthew's version, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the idea here is not so much being poor materially, although that could certainly be a part of it, but the word being used here indicates a severe poverty. The idea is someone who must literally beg for whatever they have or whatever they will get. It's talking about really a poverty of spirit. It's saying, I come to the place in my life where I realize I have no spiritual assets, that I'm really spiritually bankrupt before God. A realization that comes from the working and the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life and in your life. It means that we realize that, that we, that you, that I am a beggar fully reliant upon God for anything and for everything I get. And this is the starting point of what it means to come to Christ. This is where we start out in our walk with God. Recognizing our utter spiritual poverty. I bring nothing to the table. God didn't get a great find when he got me. In fact, he got a worthless piece of dung when he got me. That's where we start. Spurgeon said it so well as he often does, not what I have, but what I have not. This is the first point of contact between my soul and God. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, it certainly could apply to those who are materially and financially poor. But so often, that does go along with realizing you're poor in spirit. And part of the idea that he will get to and unfold as we go through this today is helping us realize that it's not who you are in the sense of your status, your achievements, your successes. Those things mean nothing before God. You do realize, I hope, that on that great day when each one of us stands before God and each one of us will stand before God, every human being, when we stand before God, we will be judged on the basis of where we stand with relation to Jesus Christ, his son, his only offering, his only sacrifice, the only payment for our sins, 
the only just and justifier of what is right. And if we are found in Christ, then we will stand before God and be judged by the righteousness of Christ. But if we are not in Christ, we will stand before God and be judged based on our own righteousness. And let me assure you, we have none. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are poor in spirit. And certainly what Jesus wanted these disciples to hear and understand, just as he does for us, is to make sure we understand that. So today, that's the starting point for us. If that's not where you are in your walk with God, and in your understanding of who he is, that he is the creator of the earth, the creator of the universe. He is the supreme being, and there is no other. If you're anywhere else other than that realization, you're in a bad place, you're in the wrong place. Because there's only one, and his name is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say in verse 21, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. In Matthew's version, blessed are you uh, who mourn. Blessed are they, uh, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In Luke's account, he adds this word, now. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Again, I don't believe this is speaking of uh, physical hunger. We all know that. We've all felt hunger from time to time. Although in the past three, four days, I doubt you have. But the hunger is a hunger for the things of God. It's a spiritual hunger. For you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. The weeping may be a sadness. It may be something you're going through, a great disappointment. It may be a broken heart. But God, as he uh, so often does, uses these things to get our attention, does he not? To draw our attention to him. He allows trials and difficulties to come into our lives to bring us to a place of brokenness so we realize that in a split second, our life could be flipped upside down. And we all know people like that if we haven't experienced ourselves who in a split second in a car accident or they go to the doctor because they're not feeling well and they find out they are terminally ill and have six months to live. These are tragic things. But in those moments, they flip our lives upside down. You know why? Because it reveals to us that we were trusting in ourselves. We were trusting in our abilities. Our ability to do what? To get a paycheck. To make a living. To put one foot in front of the other. To binge watch our favorite TV program. Whatever it might be. And so Jesus is calling our attention to our spiritual poverty. Our Poverty with respect to righteousness, our right standing before God, our poverty with respect to our ability to emotionally process things, to be sad and realize, Lord, I've got nothing. Where else can I go? But here's the thing. God uses these things in our lives. A hungry person is seeking what? Food. Their hunger drives them. Their appetite drives drives them to satisfy that need in their lives. And what God wants to do in our lives is to allow that spiritual poverty, that spiritual hunger, that spiritual brokenness to drive us to God. Spiritual hunger and thirst. Do you have it? Have you ever had it? Have you ever come to that point where you realize, like King Solomon said when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity? Ever come to that point? You've just kind of just sat there and kind of going, you know, it just doesn't make sense. We eat, we drink, we live, we die. 
I mean, it's a dark place to be philosophically, right, when you end up there. And I remember, you know, studying in high school and college, you know, you're, you're, you know things you're forced to take, you know, philosophy. Man, philosophy is a godless, empty study. It is a pursuit that will drive you into the ground. All it, all it points out is try, it tries to elevate man's ability to cope with the impossibilities of life, but we can't. The only place that we can go is to God himself. Spiritual hunger and thirst should drive us to God, should cause us to give attention to our spiritual lives, to feed the spirit and to not feed the flesh. We are told and warned in the scriptures that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. A hunger and a thirst for righteousness may express itself in different ways. A person longs to have a righteous nature. A person wants to be sanctified, to be made more holy. A person longs to continue in God's righteousness. A person longs to see righteousness promoted in the world. Now, in each of these paradoxical statements that we're looking at so far, poverty of spirit, hunger, weeping, it describes a spiritual condition. And Jesus used the word now. And what is the now pointing to? It's like, now you've realized it. Now we can do something about it. If you've ever been to any kind of a therapy group like Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever, remember the the first step is admitting. It's saying something like, hey, I'm an alcoholic or whatever your issue is. And it's our pride and our self-righteousness that prevents us from saying it. From saying I was wrong, I've made terrible mistakes in my life, I've ended up in the place that I'm in because of my own terrible poor choices because of my own lifestyle choices but the now indicates once you realize it now we can do something about it now we can deal with it properly you see admitting it isn't the end admitting it is the beginning you're poor now but one day you will receive the kingdom you're hungry now but one day you'll be filled you weep now but one day you will laugh I love this guy. His name is Pat Barrett. We sing some of his songs. If I told you which ones they were, you would know them. But uh, he wrote a song, and I was listening to it. And when I when I listen to these songs, and and I'm first of all, I'm kind of listening for myself and worshiping the Lord with it. But he wrote this song called Sparrows and Lilies, and I was I was listening to it. And uh, he's taking you know the sparrows and the lilies out of Matthew six, and how God takes care of the sparrows and the lilies, and we don't want for anything. And he has this phrase he put in there. This is sort of the the refrain or the repeating thought in the song. And and, uh, it goes like this. Come on, love, things are going to get better. Things are going to get better. You know they are. And when I first listened to the song, I started thinking about it. And I thought, well, I don't know if I can sing that because I know so many people who are just dealing with hopeless situations. But then when I considered the context that it's in, It's true, isn't it? Things are going to get better. Not because we have a positive mental attitude. Not because I just will it to be or I want to, quote, manifest it. That's the new thing going on today, right? I'm just going to manifest my happiness. It's not that. It's talking about the truth of God's word. Listen, we have nothing better to look to than God himself. The hope of heaven is to be in God's presence forevermore. And when I think about someone like our daughter, Rebecca, or other people who are dealing with things like that, and we go day to day, you're dealing with a chronic illness, whatever it might be. You know, for somebody to say, hey, man, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You're like, it doesn't feel that way. But God is gracious. And if he chooses not to heal, heal her on this earth, then he will heal her in heaven. And that is true for every one of us. Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil 
for the Son of Man's sake. Understand that this is talking about because of our right standing before God, because we've now confessed the name of Jesus. If people mistreat us because of our right relationship with God, because we, if we put it in today's words, I identify as a Christian. And if they look at that and they hate us for it or they call us names, Jesus is saying, that's okay, you're blessed, you're happy. You know why? Because you're doing something right. It's not just say, wearing the shirt that says I'm a Christian. It's wearing the life that says I'm a Christian. When they revile you and cast out your name as evil, you know in the first century when people became believers in Christ, this was so real. Why? Because to have a business, to have a right standing in the community, they had to do business with other merchants. And as soon as someone who believed in, you know, foreign gods, they believed in, in gods that were really demons, and then you come along and you say, hey man, have you heard about Jesus? And you want to tell them about what God's done in your life? And they go, you're not one of those bigoted, hateful Christians, are you? I'm not doing business with you anymore. And so many people literally went bankrupt because they said the name of Christ, because they identified as being a Christian. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for, in, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Even before Christ came along, whenever the prophets came, they would be rejected and they would be mistreated. Matthew's version again says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I suspect there are few of us who really deal with this kind of persecution. But if we ever do, this should be preparing us for the fact that we should not be surprised if it happens. Now, a secondary application of this would be understanding that if you've ever had someone just be hateful and mean to you, that we would want to treat them in like manner, that we would want to be kind to them. He's going to talk about that as we get a little bit further. What is our attitude toward people who mistreat us, who abuse us? It happens all the time in the workplace or out in the world. We have to be aware of these things and understand that before God, we draw our strength. We get our strength from his presence and from his word, from what he has to say to us. In these next couple of verses here, he speaks four woes. And the word woe, if you don't mean what, know what it means, it certainly should sort of indicate the tone of what it means. But woe to you who are rich just sort of means you're in big trouble. What is he saying here? Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Is he saying it's wrong or bad to have wealth? I don't think so. What is he saying? He says, for you have received your reward, your consolation. When we begin to trust in anything other than God himself, even in the blessings he may allow to come into our lives, we can't all of a sudden shift our focus from the place that we were, which is, God, I'm dependent on you for my daily bread. In Matthew's version in chapter 6, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and he said, give us this day our daily bread. You may be thinking, my pantry's full. But we are to recognize that God allowed that pantry to be full. Everything we have comes from the hand of God. James said it this way, Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights above, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. 
everything comes from God's hand. And even if you have plenty of money to provide for yourself in every way, you and I should never look at it as going, I'm all set. We should always look at it as, God, I have what I have by your grace. Everything in my life is a blessing from God. Let me say that again. Everything in my life is a blessing from God. And that's why he says to us, that we are to give back to him of the first fruits of what he gives to us. And whether that's plenty or whether that's few, we turn it around and say, Lord, you gave it to me. I'm giving back to you what is rightfully yours. I'm blessing you because you've blessed me. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your reward. Reminds me of the accounting of the rich young man or the rich young ruler. You may remember that story. We find it in Mark chapter 10. We have a version in Luke as well. And so the young man came to Jesus one day, and he says, a good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother, quoting to him from the second tablet of the law. And he answered and said to him, teacher, I've I've done all these things from my youth. I mean, I'm, I'm a good guy. I go to synagogue every week. I observe the law. I'm very careful. I read the Ten Commandments every day. I check the box. And then we find this in Mark's accounting of the story, and it's only in Mark's account. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Then he goes on and he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, well, well, who can be saved? Everybody has money. A lot of people have a lot of money. How can they be saved? I thought salvation was for everybody. And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. What is he talking about? It's not just the having of riches. That's not the issue. That's not the sin. He said it's for those who trust in riches. Now we can take this and apply it to wealth, but we can take this and apply it to anything, can't we? How hard it is to trust in their good health to enter the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for those who trust in the stability of the stock market and their 401k and how good it's doing or isn't doing. It applies to anything, doesn't it? James says, to give us an interesting twist on this, come now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, and you have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You see, it's not money or being wealthy. It's trusting riches in place of trusting God. God said, on the first tablet of the law, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the issue. Paul, writing to Timothy, said godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. 
But those who desire to be rich fall into a t temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And we could fill in the blank again there, couldn't we? The love of whatever becomes a root of all kinds of evil. A right relationship with God that may not change our physical circumstances, but it should change our outlook on life. It should change our attitude. It should change our perspective on our problems from being a, an earthly, cynical perspective to a godly perspective. These, these things shall pass in God's time and in God's way. To put sort of a punctuation to this topic, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus in, again, Luke's accounting of the Sermon on the Mount said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Is he saying you shouldn't save and be responsible? No, he's not saying that at all. The idea behind laying up treasures is the idea of having something that I can have a nice, safe, secure feeling about long as I have this taken care of over here, then I don't have to, that's one less thing I have to trust God for. That's kind of what it, it becomes in our minds. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So be careful. Nobody can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Same idea as what we've been talking about. Remember the parable, we'll get to it in Luke chapter 19, of the rich man and Lazarus. In this life, the rich man fared sumptuously every day, and he did great, and Lazarus was laying outside of his gate as a beggar, had sores, no health insurance, no job, no doctor. And then Jesus fast forwards and says, okay, they've died. Now the condition has flipped. The rich man's over on the bad side where there's fire and torment, and the, the, the poor man, the beggar, who had to depend upon God for every bite that went into his mouth, he's over in Abraham's bosom. And as you read through the story and the whole thing flipped around, the, the rich man says, hey, would you send somebody back to tell my family? Abraham says, well, they've got Moses, they got the law, they got the prophets, they have the word of God. God's given them all the warnings they need. He's told them the truth. They projected the truth. So no, we're not going to do a miracle. We're not going to send somebody dead back as a ghost, as an apparition, to come and speak to them like the ghost of Christmas past and warn them of things. They've got the truth. See, the issue that we don't want to deal with is one of the most unpleasant laws of God is the law of sowing and reaping, isn't it? It can either be pleasant or unpleasant, depending on how we live. If you want immediate wealth, fullness, laughter, popularity, you can get it. But there's a price to pay to get it. Because that's all you will get. Jesus did not say that these things were wrong. He said that being satisfied with them is their own judgment. H.H. H. Farmer wrote that to Jesus, the terrible thing about having wrong values in life and pursuing wrong things is not that you are doomed to bitter disappointment, but that you're not. Not that you do not achieve what you want, but that you do. You see, when people are satisfied with the lesser things of life, the good instead of the best, then their successes add up only as failures. These people are spiritually bankrupt, and they do not even realize it. That is the tragedy. Verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Beware of flattery. 
Beware of those people who come and say, oh, man, you're great, you're awesome. We'd love to hear it. That's a good thing. It can be encouraging. But beware of wrong motives in people doing such a thing. And then moving on in verse 27, your Bible might say something like, love your enemies. This deals with our attitude toward people. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. I believe this is, again, primarily in the context of our witness and our testimony. But I think it also applies just to those difficult human relationships that we probably all encounter. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Peter, in his epistle, quoting from the book of Proverbs, says, uh, for him who would love life and want to see good days, let us refrain his lips from speaking evil and his heart from guile. Too often we live by the world's version of the golden rule. Do unto others as they do unto you. That's not godly, that's not biblical, and that is not the attitude we as children of God should have. And if we ever find ourselves in that camp, you know, watching movies, isn't this attitude all over the movies? Oh, you picked the wrong person to mess with today, buddy. We love it when we see it in the movies. We love that vigilante justice and all of that stuff, don't we? But you see, that's counterproductive to the life of the child of God. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. When you see someone spitting mad at you, cussing you out, and doing all of those things, here's what we are to do. We are to see it from a spiritual point of view. Okay, maybe that person's having a bad day. Let's start with, do they know Christ? Because if they don't know Christ, we can't expect them to act any differently. What do we do? We pray for them. God, I pray you'd bring salvation to that person's house, to their heart. Their behavior, their words, their treatment of me and of others, that's just an indication of a broken person, a person who's in need of Jesus Christ. What do you do when someone who is, quote, your enemy is in your own house? That's hard, isn't it? Ever had that happen? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for those people. Love them. There's an old saying, it's not a Bible verse, kill them with kindness. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. Is he saying we should never allow the law to take over? That if somebody is mistreating us, we should just accept it? And uh, He's not saying we lay down to violence. He's just talking about how do we deal with people in our human interactions. Certainly in this day, with the Roman occupation of the land... The Romans could take someone, you know, and make them carry their burden a, a mile or an extra mile. They could certainly mistreat them. Who are you? Peasant, you know, Jew. They might speak of them in a derogatory way and mistreat them. And Jesus is simply saying to them, when that happens, if that happens, they hit you, they hurt you, they, they, they mistreat you. Give to them. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Again, in Matthew's account, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And just as you want men, verse 31, to do to you, you also do to them likewise. You see, the rabbi saying of the day was, don't do unto others as you don't want them to do unto you. Jesus flips the whole thing around and says, just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them. In other words, how you would like to be treated, that's how you should treat everybody. 
Do you want to get yelled at? Do you want to be treated meanly because you made a mistake? No. Don't these things happen in our houses all the time? We put something back in the wrong place. It wasn't wrong to me, but it's wrong to the other person. Right? These things happen, and we just have to admit these things are real in our lives. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them. What, what's he talking about? Our attitudes. Our attitudes toward people. He's not just giving us moral, ethical, you know, pearls of wisdom here. This is the heart of God. This is, the how, this is how he wants us to think about people. Why? How does God think of us? Does God give to us what we deserve? No, thank God that he doesn't. When God withholds from us what we deserve, we call that what? Mercy. We want mercy. And when God gives to us what we don't deserve, we call that grace. Do we want grace and mercy from God? Yes. When I stand before the throne of God, do I want grace and mercy? You bet I do. So when I stand before people, do I want grace and mercy from them? You bet I do. Therefore, I treat them the way I want to be treated. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Isn't it easy to love people who love you? I mean, the people who are our friends, let's admit it, they're the people who love us. We're friends with them because they love us. I don't have a best friend who hates my guts. Right? If you do, you might need therapy. If you love those who love you, that's the easy part. What credit is that to you for even sinners love those who love them? That's the easy part. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. It's so easy to return kindness to somebody, isn't it? But when someone treats us poorly, well, you know what? That's the last time they'll get anything from me. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. He's dealing with every area of our life, every area of our interactions with people. Verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return. Why? And your reward will be great. Where is it going to come from? Who's going to pay me back my loan with interest? God. God will take care of it. And you will be sons of the Most High. Isn't that what we want to be, sons and daughters of the Most High? For he, that is God, is kind to the unthankful and the evil. I love those verses and don't miss them when Paul writes and he says, and such were some of you. Because every single person who comes to Jesus was once in the place of spiritually poor, spiritually bankrupt, in need of God, not being kind to God, wanting nothing but my own best, you know, good, my own self-interest. And when he says to us in verse 36, therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Listen, our relationship with God is based entirely on grace and mercy, is it not? We're going to go through parables that Jesus will tell, you know, the unmerciful steward, right? He went before somebody begging for mercy from a debt he couldn't repay. And when we study it and we look at the amount of the debt, I mean, it would have taken him 10, 15, 20 lifetimes to pay the amount of money he owed. And that debt was forgiven. And then that man turned around and went to a guy who owed him like five bucks, threw him in debtor's prison because he couldn't pay him his five bucks and completely missed the point of what the master did to him in forgiving his debt and 
The judge then brought him back and judged him way more harshly than he would have been judged and threw him in prison for life. So it is in our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. You see, we should not make the mistake of treating people poorly because somehow we feel like we're privileged or it's okay to do that when we have been forgiven everything. Paul wrote in Colossians, just as you have been forgiven, so you also should forgive others. James said it so well, for judgment without judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The reason we won't receive judgment from God is the mercy that has come to us by the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 37, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Isn't this probably the most misquoted and misunderstood verse by those who do not know Christ? Hey man, don't judge me. I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever lifestyle I want. Don't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge me. He gets us. That's the commercial, right? Such a misunderstanding. The idea here is not so much us putting ourselves in the place of God, which is what people are talking about. And by the way, God will judge those things, right? He's talking about the way we look at people, the way we deal with people. In Matthew's account, judge not that you not be judged for With that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What's he talking about? The way we treat people, the way we act toward people. When we become judgmental toward people, it breeds within our heart a root of bitterness. Somehow we've set ourselves up as the judge of someone else. You know what? They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it right, whatever it is. James says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? That's James's take on this idea. So the idea is don't set yourself up as a judge to other people, to their life, to their behavior. Now, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can certainly see what's happening in someone's life and come alongside them to encourage them, to help point them in the right path. But we do so in humility. We do so with the love of Christ. We speak the truth in love, as Paul said. We don't come to condemn And we certainly don't put ourselves in the place of God, do we? The Christian is called to show unconditional love, but the Christian is not called to show unconditional approval. We can really love people who do things that should not be approved of. Unconditional love and unconditional approval are not the same thing, and that's what people want when they say, hey man, don't judge me. They think it means unconditional approval, and that's not what God is saying. He says in verse 38, give and it will be given to you, good measure. This this verse is only in Luke, I love it, you should underline it and highlight it. Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. Would you like to have that done to you? The idea here is taking how in the first century, of course, they wore sort of long flowing robes. And they had like a belt or a sash around their waist. And when they would go to market, they would take that robe and tuck it in and basically create like a a shopping bag, like a pouch. And so when they would go and they say, you know, I want a a measure of grain or whatever it might be, they would kind of just open their a fold and they would put it in. And that would be what they would use to carry home, right? And so the idea here is this. 
Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You know how it is. There's some things like flour and things like that. If you, you know, there's a cup that's pressed and there's a cup that's not pressed, right? And you, you get more when it's pressed down. You understand that? You sort of tamp it and it shakes down. And here the idea is this. You've gone to market. You've done good things. And the merchant who's dealing with you gives you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be put into your bosom. And you're looking at it going, man, you gave me way more than I asked for. And what is he saying? For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. This is both an encouragement and a warning. The way we look at others, the way we treat others, that's the way we're going to be treated. And sometimes, you know, we need to look in the mirror. We don't, you know, we are our own worst judges, right? We don't see our flaws. It's true, doesn't it? This is why we need friends that you can go to and you say, look, where are the blind spots in my life? What are the things that I don't see that you see that I should be aware of? And when you ask that question, you need to be prepared to receive the answer. I will never forget a dear, dear friend, a pastor friend, a saint. This was many, many years ago, around 1993, and I only remember that because I remember the phone call. Like, it was piercing. A good friend, he could have been my dad. He you know, certainly old enough to be my dad. And he called me one day. I was at work, and he said, you know, I know you're at work, and I just want to, if you have a couple minutes, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. It's good to hear from you. Well, it wasn't good to hear from him because... He did it in the most kind, humble way. He truly spoke the truth and love to me. But he pointed out some things about my attitude that I did not realize that I was doing. And he pointed it out in the most kind, most loving way. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to have to tell you this. And he told me, he listed out the things. And he said, I hope that you'll take these things and pray on them. I love you. And that was the conversation. And that turned my life around. It really did. Because he said something to me that no one in that po- up to that point in my life had been willing to say to me. And I didn't see it. And I didn't know it. And I didn't realize how it was affecting the people around me. And once he told me, I realized uh, it had actually come from my family. This is just the way, actually, my mother had... You know, we just kind of grew up in the house with her, and this is the way she talked about people when the doors were closed and the attitude she had, sort of an attitude of complaining and negativity, and the glass is 51, you know, 49% as opposed to 50%, you know, the glass is half empty and all that. And I just didn't realize I had all of that. For this part here, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. When you notice your circle of friends shrinking because people don't want to hang out with you, it's not just because you have bad breath. It's because you're not a pleasant person to be around. We judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions, don't we? We're far more generous to ourselves than to others. These are hard things to deal with, aren't they? As we wrap up these last couple of verses, verse 39, and he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? Now Jesus at this point is speaking about the scribes and the Pharisees, calling them the blind, even though they call themselves the spiritually aware, the leaders of Israel. Remember Jesus and his interaction with Nicodemus in John chapter 3? As he's talking about, hey, a man must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? I can't go back into my mother's room. And and what does Jesus say to him? He's like, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? The blind leading the blind. Will they not both fall into the ditch? Of course. That's kind of a preposterous scenario. But here's something for us to think about something that may be more subtle that maybe we don't realize that we do. The world is blind, aren't they? Those who don't know Christ we're talking about. 
And we have to be careful about, quote, the sources of wisdom. And I'll just give an example, news, that we listen to. We have to be aware of allowing the secular media, or really anyone, anything, quote, influencers, whoever those might be today on social media. That's a big thing, right? Everywhere. Influencers on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all of that. Be careful of the people we're listening to. Why? Because if they don't know Jesus Christ, then how do we know what they're telling us is the truth? And of course, we have to be aware there because there can be false prophets and false teachers. Point is, we need to be very careful who and what we listen to or what we regard as truth and wisdom. An unsaved person cannot tell an unsaved person how to be saved. Understand? An unsaved person cannot lead a believer. That's why Paul said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so we have to be aware of what we call truth or who we allow to be influencers in our lives. Finally, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That's the humility of a disciple or a learner coming to his teacher. So be wary of your attitude of pride. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not perceive the plank in your own? This has always been something that people have heard and understood as being sort of a preposterous example. And the idea, if we turned it around to modern thinking, is this. Would you go see an eye doctor who had a big beam sticking out of his eye? You'd be kind of like, uh, dude, I, I'm going to, I got to go find another doctor. I'm not going to see you. Thank you. What's he talking about here? Do we all get specks in our eyes? Of course we do. But the idea is hypocrisy. The idea is thinking, I've got it figured out and I'm the expert. You know, the term today in business is subject matter expert. We've probably heard that. What do you know? We need to go to a consultant. We need to go to a subject matter expert. Then you get to them and they're the most, you know, morally corrupt, arrogant people. And you want to call them in to tell you how to run your business or to deal with this issue. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that's in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. What's the point? What's the moral? Look at yourself in the mirror first. Assess yourself. Are you, are you walking in hypocrisy or are you walking in truth? these last two things. It's easy to help a brother with his faults so we can cover up our own sins. People who are constantly criticizing others are usually guilty of something worse in their own lives. Isn't that true? Life, and I find what I'm about to say to you is something I realize more and more every day as I age. Life is built on character, and character is built on decisions. But decisions are based on values, and values must be accepted by faith from God's word. Life is built on character. Character is built on decisions. But decisions are based on values, and values must be accepted by faith from God's word. In other words, our views of our circumstances, of the world, of people, and even of God, which we'll get to next week, must be informed by God's word. And those values and those decisions are hopefully made in faith before God and not willy-nilly based on our own wisdom or the wisdom of someone from the world who is a blind guide. When we have the word of God, we have the spirit of God, and we have the people of God to guide us. So, our attitude is spiritual. Let's let God himself inform us. Let's let his word inform us. Let's let his spirit lead us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us. We bless your holy name. You've been so good and so kind to us. And Father, may we take our cues from you. 
May we allow ourselves in a healthy way to be examined by your word. James called it the perfect mirror of your word. And as we look into it, may we not miss the truth. May we see the truth about you and about ourselves. And may we be willing to comply, to be moldable, to be flexible by you and to your word. And allow you, as Paul said, to conform us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. May we start with that spiritual poverty, recognize who we are before you, humble ourselves, come to you and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because, Lord, that's what we want. And then help us to be merciful to those around us, to extend grace to those around us, to properly assess people and situations, to see the spiritual side and to pray for them rather than judging them. Lord, guide us in all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Shall we stand and sing?